welcome everybody to another edition of Showtime with Koo. Insightful BS with my Laker teammates <laughs> and NBA legends. <laughs> and in the house, starting our fast break. You know what? They used to talk about the Lakers Showtime and always ended with either a Koopa Loop or a Worthy Dunk or a Kareem Sky Hook. But this guy here is the one that got the shit started. Kurt Rambus, how you doing, sir? I, I'm terrific, Coop. How are you? I, so I guess you can swear you can do about anything on this, huh? You can do everything but get naked. Now, don't get naked. Can't show me right. you know that. Uh, nobody wants to see that. You, you'll lose subscribers if that happens. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Kurt, let's just get right to it, man. You know what? The fun part for me is doing this is I get to do a little background work. So I go to Wikipedia and I get to look up you guys and find some things. And this so you I get a lot of it. misinformation. Is that what you're doing? <laughs> no, it's not. Because on your Wikipedia, the first thing goes Kurt Rambis. And under that, it goes Daryl Kurt Rambis. I did not know you were a Daryl. Yeah, it's uh, my parents. I, I can't explain them. <laughs> they grew, they were born and grew up in Indiana, but somehow they liked the the names Kurt and Daryl, but they didn't like uh, Kurt Daryl, so they liked Daryl Kurt better, and that's so. What they when did you they cut were. it to just Kurt Rambus? I, I I can't explain them. I can't. I, I asked them the question. They didn't give me anything that made any sense, but that's- So you were always Kurt? Your first was name was Daryl? My, my mom wanted to name me Lonnie. So uh, um, Lonald, Lonnie, and my dad said, no, he wasn't having that. So somehow it ended up with Kurt Daryl. So. <laughs> oh, anyway, we love you as Kurt Rambus. Kurt, let's go back to the earlier days real quick. And you just mentioned something that, again, that I didn't know about you. Terra Hawk, Indiana. Why didn't you just stay there and go to school with Larry Bird? <laughs> we, uh, my parents got out of Indiana. It was, it was interesting for them. Both sides of their families are there, but they wanted to get out of Indiana and kind of be out on their own. So they moved out to California. We were first in Bakersfield area, Ridgecrest uh, specifically. There was an Air Force base out there. And my dad was a high school teacher and coach. And then we moved up to Northern California, Cupertino. Nobody ever used to know where Cupertino was, but now because of Apple and Google and everybody else that's up there now, it's uh, everybody knows where Cupertino is. So just getting out of Indiana, that's all. And then you find your way to Santa Clara. When did you really realize that you could become an NBA basketball player or did you at that time? <laughs> never actually <laughs> yes most people <laughs> i never did <laughs> you know it was uh, uh it was always a dream uh always a dream to play in the nba uh just you know uh, back thinking back when uh, watching basketball when i was a kid nba finals were tape delayed when i was a senior in college i mean that's how far nba games have come but i just remember watching NBA games and going out and shooting hoops and trying to emulate everything that I saw out there in the game. So I just, uh, it was a dream. It was a dream come true. And you know what? You had some great times at uh, Santa Clara. You graduated from there. You were the uh, what, a, a third round draft pick in 1980 with the Knicks. Uh, things didn't go well. You got waived. And then <laughs> you have Greek descent. <laughs> And I'm a, I'm a butcher your name because I'm not really good at it. But you played in Greek under the name Kakairos Rambidis. Yes, you did butcher it. That's exactly <laughs> what you did. Kyriakos Rambidis. It's a direct translation. So it, I had a I had a terrific time. I played for a team called Ike Athletic Union of Constantinople AEK. Um, and they were kind of the Boston Celtics uh, of old when I got there. They'd won a lot of European Cup and Greek Cup championships before I got there. So uh, we won the year that I was there. So it was a, it was great for that organization to win again. It was a lot of fun. It was a real good growing up experience for me. First time being really away from home. Uh, I remember flying on the plane. I was probably about halfway there. I had no idea where I was going. I didn't even know if they played basketball in Greece. I mean, there was, I, had, I, had, I didn't know who was picking me up at the airport. I didn't know what my, who my teammates were. So it was, a, it was a real growing up kind of experience for me. 
and Kurt, you know what? Some of the things we learned overseas, and it was for me, it was after my playing years because you played 14 years, but being over there, is there anything that you learned over there to help you prepare for the NBA when you came back? You know, most of it was just a, a maturation process. I, uh, it was kind of, uh, at that time, um, basketball in Greece has gotten a lot better, but it was probably Division II, Division three college basketball. Uh, that's about the level that it was at. Um, some good players were over there that played in college. Um, Nick Gallus, who played at Seton Hall, was probably the all-time scorer in, in, in Greek history. Very good shooter. But um, just expanding my game, growing my game, getting more confidence uh, in playing. Also, the experience when I was drafted by the Knicks, I went to training camp. So I got a feel for what NBA ball players were like, their size, their speed, their quickness, and just wanted to go to Greece and have an opportunity to continue playing and uh, expand my game a little bit, uh, gain more confidence and in, in, in just growing my game. And when I came back and I had every intention of going back to Greece uh, because I had such a good experience there. Uh, and I was playing in a summer league, a pro-am up in San Francisco, and I got asked to come down and try out for the Lakers by Mike Thibodeau, uh, who was a, a longtime coach in the WNBA and, and worked in the NBA as well. And he asked me if I'd come down and try out for the, for the Lakers. And, and that was a year they'd signed Mitch Kupchak to a big deal. They had Jim Brewer on the team. They had Mark Landsberger on the team. It was like, well, why do you guys need me? I'm not going to come down and and try out so but playing in Greece was a lot of fun I had a great time there and you know what uh, Kurt and you know I think what gets lost sometimes and it definitely gets lost for me but I think our our paths are kind of like similar you know uh and you were a scorer in high school and college I mean you got your jersey retired at Cupertino High School uh and that means you had to score points I was a pretty good scorer in college but when we got to the Lakers it was about finding your niche and once you were, once you came to the Lakers uh, uh, team, how did you find your niche? I mean, when I got there, they had Kareem, Norm, and, and Jamal told me Jerry West was the coach said, Cooper, I don't need no more scores. I need somebody to play defense. Were you told that same thing kind of like? I was told something very, very similar by Paul Westhead when I was uh, trying out with, uh, with the Knicks. He liked the way that I played defense fence and rebound of the basketball and I always enjoyed that aspect of the game I never liked it when people scored on me and rebounding was always fun being a big guy and uh, Westhead wanted somebody to initiate the fast breaks so he told me that I would have a real legitimate shot at making the Laker team if I came down and focused on those areas he saw potential in me uh, when I was trying out with the with the Knicks in the, in the LA Summer League so I went down and focused on those areas, knowing that I also had a job in Greece waiting for me to return there. So that gave me more confidence. So I went down there with all of you old grizzled vets. And I told, I said to myself, I wasn't going to let any of you guys push me around or beat me up because that was one of my concerns that I was just being brought in to kind of, you know, get everybody in shape and get everybody working hard. But I, I think that once I focused on those areas, that it really helped the team, uh, the teams that I was on, because he wanted to run. He wanted everybody to get out and run. And if, if you really want to run, you've got to do it consistently and you got to do it off of rebounding and you got to, you got to do it off of outlet passes, even the inbound passes, you know, after makes. So I just focused on those areas and um, was fortunate enough that the NBA increased the roster from 11 men to 12 men that year. So they gave me an opportunity to make that spot. <laughs> if they had one single spot, because if they stayed at 11, I wasn't going to make the team. In, so. in the book Showtime, it was written about your experience there with the Lakers at that time where you were was sleeping on a teammate's floor, a mattress, or was the agent or somebody that worked with the Lakers. You had like one corduroy jacket that you were wearing, right? Like how much, like take us through what that was like, because what it was written about you within that period of time is incredible. <laughs> well, I, I, uh, I wasn't living with a teammate. I was living with a college friend of mine. Um, he, he was a football player and he lived down in Huntington Beach and never knew if I was going to make the team. There's a certain right. point where a contract becomes guaranteed. So never knew if I was going to uh, end up sticking around. 
Um, so I was just staying with him and it was, I was sleeping on a mattress in a sleeping bag in his <laughs> dining room, you know, just, you know, he had young kids at the time and the, the corduroy jacket came in more because I was uh, pissed off at, at Pat Riley for instituting a dress code. So he said, you know, you got to wear, you got to wear sport coats and stuff. So I go, okay, I'll buy one sport coat. And I wore it all year long. I never changed it. Never bought another one. <laughs> I'm not a guy that likes to dress up. So it's a, it was a way to kind of piss off, uh, pissed off Riley for bringing in that dress coat kind of rule. But uh, Mitch Kupchak ended up uh, blowing out his knee prior to contracts becoming guaranteed and got an opportunity wow. to start. So uh, I knew my contract was going to be guaranteed prior to that date. So playing, it was just a very, a lot of fortunate, good luck things had to happen uh, for me to make the team and get an opportunity to play and build a whole career. Otherwise, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you guys right now. I would have been playing in Greece and you would have had no interest in it. So. It's so crazy. Yeah. What about the What about the glasses? Obviously, you've always worn glasses, but like, you're so known for the glasses, especially when you play. I mean, obviously you had your game spoke for itself and you had a, a niche that you were really good at, but you're, I mean, did the glasses were such a part of your brand and who you were and how you were, how you were known. Um, it, it wasn't because I liked the glasses. It wasn't because I wanted to wear the glasses when I was growing up, started wearing glasses in the third grade. And I always play sports, sports, football, basketball, baseball. And, you know, you, you get hit in the face sometimes or whatever. And the glasses would always break. And my dad would have to drive me down to the local drug store to, to get new glasses or get them fixed. And he, he it made him so mad that I was always breaking them. But I couldn't play without them because they couldn't right. see. Could so see. I always <laughs> had to wear them. So he finally asked the uh, optometrist if there was an indestructible pair of glasses. He said, we just got these in, those ugly black things. Now, can you imagine, you know, when I was growing up, uh, glasses were not cool, you know, and so now <laughs> I've got to wear them all the time. And now I got to wear these black, ugly things that were indestructible. So, but I was, it kept me playing all of those sports. And uh, so it was a way for me to see and for me to, uh, a way for me to play. And I had to put up with a lot of teasing and ridicule for wearing them. But uh, it was just part of the only way to play. I tried contacts, tried hard, soft, neither one of them worked for uh, different reasons, but the glasses seemed to work for me. So I just kept using them. It's funny that it became such a big part of your, the brand and the allure of you. I mean, I'm sure you'd show up to, um, you know, games and people be at the forum, people be wearing the glasses, right? I mean, it was like Rick Wild Thing Vaughn, you know, I mean, that's like a real life Rick Wild Thing Vaughn. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty funny. Yeah, Rambus Youth had a lot to do with that, you know, just uh, sporting the glasses and being a, a fan club and supporting me for the effort that I put out there on the court. So it's, uh, it's kind of funny, really. It's kind of funny for, for things that I did not like, you know, right. they became something that was, uh, I, I became very identifiable with. Yeah. And along with the glasses, Ari, is, uh, you know, everybody in the NBA likes those cool names, you know, like you, you knew Magic by just one name, Magic, and you knew Kareem, and and uh, there was a little bit of Coop, but then it became Superman. Yeah. And that was Kurt, Clark Kent with the glasses. And uh, I mean, Kurt, did you enjoy that? I mean, I know you kind of fed off of it, but I mean, how did that name first strike you when you first started hearing people call you that? Um, you know, it's a little embarrassing. I'm not that kind of person, you know what I mean? And, and people even ask me to sign an autograph and say, hey, can you write Superman on there? And I go, ah, I'm not Superman. <laughs> I'll sign my name, but I'm not going to put that on there. But it, it's, uh, it just became a nickname that stuck around. I think Norm started calling me Clark Kent and the Superman kind of came out of that because of wearing the glasses. Um, but it's a uh, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun just doing, but it wasn't something that I tried to parlay or, or, or make happen for myself. It was just something that just kind of organically happened. Hey, you're listening to Showtime with Coop podcast, Insightful BS. And today we got Kurt Rambert spilling some BS with us on the show. Uh, Kurt, we're at the segment of my uh, show where I have called Coop's Lightning Round. I'm going to give you five names and you tell me as much as you want about that person I give you, okay? Okay. Here we go, Dr. Buss. I, I, iconic owner. 
somebody that transformed uh, basketball and turned it into a real entertainment business. He not only wanted to put an entertainment uh, component out there on the floor and play a, a stylistic brand of basketball that was exciting for everybody to watch, but he wanted it to be entertaining throughout. He wanted to have cheerleaders out on the floor, which was unheard of at the time because there was a lot of dead time in basketball games. So he said, we got to find a way to entertain the fans and keep them interested and keep them watching the, the game and give them something to, to watch. So he brought out the Laker girls, which hadn't been done before. And he also wanted to create an environment where people enjoyed watching other people in the stands. So he made a point of turning it into a real social event by inviting a lot of celebrities, musicians that were also fans of basketball. So you not only had entertainment during the, the game and bringing a brand of basketball that was exciting for everybody to watch, he got an awful lot of talent out there on the floor. So the team was winning. Fans wanted to come, entertainers, musicians, uh, actors, they all wanted to come. And then the Laker girls out there. So it really turned into showtime. It was a complete show from beginning to end. And he was one that really brought a lot of that to the NBA. And he had a lot of, you know, his vision and his ability to see what people wanted uh, was just mesmerizing at that time. And he really turned it into an entertainment business, which is a big part of what uh, NBA ball is right now. Rambo, of all the celebrities that used to come, who did you enjoy seeing come? Mine was Diane Cannon. Who was yours? Um, you know, I think they all had their, their interesting components because you saw them on television. There were even musicians. Uh, I became uh, friends with the, with the uh, Ario Speedwagon, which in the 80s, they had the number one rock album in, in the world. And even seeing Jack Nicholson there and stuff. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, it's like, it, it's funny because you, you look at actors and, and uh, uh, musicians, they all wanted to be athletes and basketball players and then basketball players, they, they all wanted to be actors and musicians. So they always, you know, just having conversations with them and seeing that they're all just really nice human beings and they're very similar to us. So it was just, it was fun to see everybody and anybody that showed up. Okay, next person, Jerry West. You know, he uh, obviously still the logo of the NBA, but his basketball mind is second to none. His ability to see and recognize talent and communicate with people and, and understanding the game of basketball. And he had a way of relating to agents and players and, and fans. And he just loved the game. He really, really loved the game. From when he grew up, there wasn't any component of the game that he did not love. He, from the entertainment to putting a team together to winning a championship, he's just an iconic winner in the NBA. Uh, next person, Kevin McHale. <laughs> Cheap shot artist. <laughs> no, Kevin was a highly skilled basketball player. Very difficult. Girl, you can say something play. bad about that long neck freak, man. You can say what you want to about <laughs> yeah. him. Close hey. lines, you remember that. So, <laughs> you know, if uh, I, I would probably be in jail right now if I had <laughs> if I had been able to do what I wanted to do after he <laughs> upended me. Because I, I was going after him. If you watch the tape, I'm headed right towards oh, him. Oh, I saw it. You sure Where were. he pushes me into the into the reporters, and I end up falling down, and Larry Bird ends up helping me up. By then, I was too tired <laughs> to do anything else. But I was, you know, it's just something you don't do in basketball. So I was going after blood. If I if I had a clear path, I was going after him. So I may have gotten in a lot of trouble. The funny thing about all of that huge brawl everybody's pushing and shoving benches are clearing and the referees just go okay Kurt go shoot your two free throws and let's keep playing <laughs> that was the end of it it, it wouldn't happen no in today Jay. no fines nothing there was nothing that happened right there. yeah uh next person Phil Jackson you know just a brilliant leader of men he does he did a great job of of bringing in an offense where the players had to really learn how to cooperate and work together. That was the only way the offense was going to work. So it was, a, it was a shared offense. It was a movement offense. It was a passing offense. And it was really designed to help 
the the lesser players the role players the great players they really don't they can survive in any system they you know they'll figure out how to be great but in having an offense that helps the other players the role players create shots for themselves create shots for others and it really connected everybody with with all player movement with all ball movement everybody was connected and it took uh, it took a while for a lot of guys to figure out how to make it work but once they did it became simple and when if when you watch those great uh, Chicago Bulls or Lakers team they almost looked bored out there because it just got to a point where we were all connected. We all knew what we had to do out there um, in, in coaching those guys. But all they did was read the defense. Whatever the defense did, it was going to be wrong. And everybody knew what they were supposed to do in reading the defense. So coaching wise, he did a, a fabulous job of bringing talented players uh, to play together and, and make sacrifices for each other. And, you know, you, you can't argue with his winning, whether it was here in Chicago, he won a lot of rings. Now, this next one I'm going to ask you, Kurt. I want you to really think about it and give me a truthful answer, okay? Michael the Cooper form, sucked. The, the, <laughs> <laughs> what? Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Rambus. Okay, now you know why you didn't get a lot of passes from me. Uh, the Forum Club. The Forum Club. That, uh, it probably was the place to be in Los Angeles uh, for everybody and anybody. Musicians, actors, women, players, owners, uh, businessmen. It, uh, it was the place to be. Um, very entertaining. If you were into watching people, it was a great place to watch people. It was also a, a place where a lot of people, <laughs> in some respects, may have gotten in trouble. So, <laughs> but uh, it, that's it, what it, we want to hear that part, right? <laughs> now. Yeah, yeah, I don't know if I can do that. But uh, there was, you know, it was a place where a, a lot of people came and hung out. It was probably the club in Los Angeles at that time that everybody wanted to go to and everybody wanted to be in. Do you think it rivals Studio Fifty Four in New York? Um. From what I understand, I was never in Studio 54 in New York, but there was a lot more drugs. Well, that, I just saw it on TV and heard Studio lot. 54 than what was happening in the, in the Forum Club. So same number of women, probably, but not the number of drugs. <laughs> so, Kurt, uh, I know you got limited time, and I thank you for coming on. A couple more questions. This one here is big to me because I've always had a chance to talk to a lot of coaches. You coach for several teams, the Knicks, Minnesota, the Lakers. Who is the hardest player that you've had to coach? Um, interesting question. I, I don't think that any player is uh, more difficult than, than any other player because they, they all have components of how they view the game. And the, the part that you want to get with every player, no matter how they view the game, you want them to connect with their teammates so that everybody's thinking the game the same way. So it's more about having a conversation with players from great players, uh, elite ball players um, to even role players uh, you have to get them to either expand their game to kind of fit into how everybody plays or sacrifice components of their game to help the team be successful. And in, in terms of players, um, understanding that I, I don't think I've ever had a player that wasn't able to uh, achieve those concepts. Sometimes it took a lot, you know, more time for them to kind of get it to understand. And the difficult part is, you know, guys moving on, players are always moving in and out. So you got a new group of guys coming in and you're trying to convince them how to play the right way or play together rather is uh, not necessarily the right way, but play together. And it's getting guys to make sacrifices. That's that's the that's probably the hardest part for most players is to get them to make sacrifices. And some of them, it's expanding their game. You know, maybe it's a great offensive player, and you want him to be a very good defensive player. So you got to get him to practice in those areas. Or maybe even somebody that is a really good shooter, and you need him to pass the ball more. So getting guys to understand how they can make sacrifices and the team ends up having success is uh, uh, 
the, the ultimate goal of any coach. Kurt Rambis, last couple of questions for you, big guy. Kurt, you're in the front office now, and the Lakers won the championship in this COVID thing that we've been through in the bubble. Uh, came up short last season, but yourself, along with your wife, Linda, Jeannie Buss, Rob Palenka, we put this thing back together again. I'm predicting. You don't have to say it. I'm going to say it for you. Lakers are going to win the championship this year if they stay healthy. How has that process been going? I know one of the biggest things that I complained about last year is letting JaVale McGee and Dwight Howard get in the way. You bring in Gasol and Montrez, some good players, but not the type of players that can truly give AD a breather. And I think you have reassembled that now. You got some good talent. Talk to us about the Laker team this season. No, we're, we're very optimistic about our team. It was unfortunate that uh, what happened with Dwight and he ended up going to uh, Philadelphia, but he's back in the fold now. And Javel has gotten more money than we were able to play to pay him rather. So um, he was a huge component of our championship team, but I think we've got, we reassembled and we've got a, another move or, or, or two to make that we think is going to solidify our, our ball club. But uh, the way I always look at it is, you know, we, we want to give the coaches good players so that they have an opportunity uh, to win a championship. And we want to give the players good coaches so that they can help lead them through that process of winning a championship. And we think we have that now. So you, you can never guarantee a championship, but you can feel like you have a legitimate shot. I mean, every, every player, every coach, every team says, yeah, I want to win a championship, but they don't do all of the things to give their team a chance. And I think we've given our team and coaches and fans a, a chance to win a championship. Now it's up to the players and coaches to really pull together and like I was saying earlier, they got to make the sacrifices. Guys have to be willing to play together. And some of, us, of the sacrifices is just going to be time. We have a, a lot of good players. We have a lot of depth on our team. And there's just not enough playing time to go around. So guys have to have a great attitude. And we, we think we have the players that have that desire to do whatever it takes to win a championship because we have a lot of guys that haven't won that really want to win. And they're going to be the driving force of keeping everybody motivated and in tune with each other so that they can give themselves a chance to be successful at the end of the season. How much player input should go into offseason acquisitions? And, and obviously player input, I mean, in a guy like LeBron, but every organization has players like that, not like LeBron, but star players that want to have some input in decisions. How do you weigh that? Oh, it's critically important. We ask LeBron and AD about everybody that we put on the ball club. I mean, I, I think it would be foolish of us not to involve them. Now, we can't always do everything that they want just because right. of, you know, the trades and, and the salary cap and other issues from a business standpoint. We can't always do everything that they want. But every single player on this team, we've run by them and asked. Uh, and some guys, they said, well, I, I would like to have one of these three guys, or I would prefer this guy or that guy. But sometimes guys get offered, you know, more money and more years from another team that we just can't do. So, uh, you know, financially, sometimes there's right. restrictions, but every single player on this team, we've gotten LeBron and AD's input on it. And now in some respect, uh, Russell Westbrook too. Uh, in adding a player of his caliber and, and his capabilities, we want to involve him in the decision making as well to make sure that they are comfortable and confident in the players that they're going to be playing with, because those are the guys that are going to be driving our team. So we want them to be surrounded with the type of players and character and individual talent uh, that they want to play with and need to play with. You know what, Ramison, uh, last question for me. I think the biggest, the two biggest pieces that you got that I really think that go back to what you said, players that never won, that want to win, Russell Westbrook and Carmelo Anthony. I think those are going to be two big pieces because them guys have had all the individual accolades. And I can see now that Carmelo for sure, because of what he did up in Portland. But Russell, I think, is going to be conformed to the team concept to where it's time to win a championship and what a great opportunity and you're back at home doing it. Oh, absolutely. And I think we have the, the, the type of players that are going to hold each other accountable. We have guys on our team that are going to, that haven't won, like you said, 
that are going to demand that the players that have won hold them accountable and hold them accountable to lead and vice versa. The guys that have won and, and talking with players that have never won, they're going to hold them accountable to doing the right things as well. And, you know, we've added a lot of new players on this ball club. And like I was talking about earlier, there's a lot of them. They're going to have to make sacrifices and their roles are going to have to be adjusted. But if they really want to win, they're going to hold each other accountable. They're just going to make those sacrifices. At the end of the day, nobody remembers on a championship team how many points somebody scored, who did what, who started, who didn't, you know, it, it all gets blurred over time. But what they do remember is that you've got a giant ring on your finger and you were part of a championship team. And that's what everybody on our ball club, from coaches to players, they have to realize, they have to accept, they have to acknowledge, and everybody's got to hold everybody accountable. What are you willing to sacrifice this year for the team? I promise to do no more blogs with Michael Cooper <laughs> as my sacrifice. <laughs> there you have it from my boy Rambo. Kurt, thank you, thank you, thank you so much, man. Uh, I know y'all going to get it done. You can kind of keep it down low. I'm going to put it out loud. Lakers winning the championship, and they're going to sweep everybody until they get to the finals, and it don't matter who come out the East, they're going to beat them. Kurt, we love you, man. Thank you for your time, dude, okay? Thanks, Michael. From, from okay, your see mouth ya. to God's ears, thank you very much. We appreciate it, <laughs> Love you, Rambo. Bye. All right. Take care, guys. Take care. Thank you.